Hello everybody out there and welcome to this Q&A webinar at the end of 2018. The end of a year always means that we are anticipating a new year and actually in three days we are going to write 2019. So that's the perfect time for good resolutions and for example experiencing new things, learning new skills and practicing all we have known until now and asking all your questions you have concerning abdominal ultrasound. So the topic of this webinar will be, as announced, abdominal ultrasound. But first, we want to introduce ourselves, because maybe some of you out there don't know us already from our online courses or live events. My name is Ulrike Handler. I'm Christian Eiginger. We are both internal specialists working in Viennese hospitals, and our main field of interest is diagnostic ultrasound, especially abdominal ultrasound. We still love to perform ultrasound examinations ourselves, but we are really passionate about teaching abdominal ultrasound in our online and hands-on courses. We both are instructors of the Austrian Society of Ultrasound and Medicine, and we want to become you, a perfect uh, ultrasound uh, expert for abdominal ultrasound. So, we want to help getting better step by step and the aim of this webinar is to be closer to you and to answer all your questions. So how, what does this mean in concrete terms? We have got tons of questions you already sent to us and we will imply them into this webinar. But there's also the possibility to ask live questions over here. You see this little chat box at your screen and you can type in your questions and we will try to answer all of them on the floor during this webinar. And uh, if we can't cover all your questions right now, don't worry, we will come back to them and answer them per email. So I hope we can cover all your questions, but let's get started now. So for the first question, it's from Akida and the question is how to diagnose intestinal obstruction via ultrasound. So thanks a lot Akida for this very important question. This is an issue which is very important in our daily clinical life, especially when it comes to a patient with pain in the abdomen and if there are some hints for uh, intestinal obstruction we can diagnose this easily with ultrasound. So take a look to normal intestinal uh, bowels. So let's take some video over here and we can see these perfectly normal yeah, bowel loops. They are fluid filled they are quite small, they are less than two centimeters in diameter and there is uh, propulsive uh, peristalsis over there. So these are really healthy, normal abdominal loops of the small intestine, you can see over here. So now let's see what an ileus looks like in abdominal ultrasound. So when you compare this video clip to the one before, the normal healthy bowel, loops then you can easily see that this one here is really dilated. You know we've got the centimeters over here so this is would be normal up to 2.5 centimeters is normal and this is let's estimate it about double the size so at least about four centimeters or even more. And what you can also see is the fluid field content over there and these structures here these Cuckering's folds are seen in an ileus and it's also called the rope ladder phenomenon. This is one feature of an ileus is a rope ladder phenomenon, means the Keckring's folds we can see, also the dilatation, the fluid field content, and when you watch the peristaltic movement, you can see it's not propulsive anymore, but it's somehow going back and forth and back and forth. And it also can go round and round, in some cases like a washing machine. So that's another phenomenon of an ileus is to have this back and forth or washing machine movement, this altered peristaltic movement. And I think there's another sign of intestinal obstruction over here. You can see a filled gastrointestinal structure, which is the stomach. It's quite filled. But we see that on the next video. In the video. next video clip over here. Let's see here this, again, this dilated small intestine loop and here this is a fluid filled stomach 
And this is also a sign for obstruction because when a patient has vomited several times or even fasted for hours, the stomach should be empty. So this is also a suspicious sign for intestinal obstruction, fluid-filled stomach. And this is also important to know uh, before a planned operation to um, give the patient a gastric tube, for example, to avoid complications during anesthetics. So let's see another example mm -hmm. over there. Very easy to detect. Dilated intestinal bowel loops with back and forth movement of the feces. And you can see the folds quite good the over, here. over here. Rope yeah. ladder phenomenon Rope ladder again. Phenomenon. The altered peristaltics. And in this case, you nearly see no movement, no peristaltics. So this is a more advanced stage of an ileus. This is uh, going to paralysis over there. Okay, let's see if we've got another example here, yeah, really back lovely. and forth again. Let's see all the signs. Rope ladder phenomenon, Cochrane's folds, fluid field content, dilated bowel loops, at least more than four centimeters over here. Cutoff point, remember, is 2.5 centimeters. Uh, all the peristaltics and again, let's see the other. Remember, if the diameter is more than four centimeters, the risk for perforation is quite high. So we sh should keep this in mind and measure the diameter of the bowel loops. If there are good conditions for the ultrasound examination, we sometimes can also moment, detect... Sorry ah, to interrupt great. The, we have can to sum up. <laughs> complete the sum up of the ultrasound features of ileus. Don't forget the rope ladder phenomenon, the abnormal peristalsis, or reduced peristalsis in paralytic ileus and the filled stomach in fasting or vomiting patients. So now it's your turn. Okay, so sometimes we go and also detect the cause for the intestinal obstruction. Maybe there is a carcinoma in the colon, so we can look for this. Now take a close look for the normal findings in abdominal scan of the colon. We can see this over here. There's a gas filled bowel loop, a great bowel loop. And you can see the easily the hostration of the colon over there. So we leave this clip for a few seconds so that you can uh, just watch how normal great intestine will look like, what the normal colon looks like. And you can hardly detect the wall of the intestine. It's less than two millimeters in this scene. And in comparison to that? There's a complete different finding over here. You see the gas-filled portion of the colon, and then there is a quite hypoechoic thickening of the wall, and you can detect the anterior and the dorsal wall because it's so much thickening over there that the lumen is narrowing and there is nearly no gas in between these layers. I so we can just stop here. Videos. So okay. here, I think there's. Uh, let's go back a little bit. I think the first one is the best. Yes, because... We have the gas field yes. portion and it stops at this point where there is a hypoechoic tumor in this region. And in this case, it was a mm -hmm. colon carcinoma blocking the great bowel and causing an uh, intestinal obstruction over there. Okay, let me show this to you again. This hostration. colon with, with hostration and this hypoechoic mass over there is the tumor of the colon. Here okay. again, the diameter, right. you see, more than five Six centimeters. Here another example. This is a very interesting finding. It's a so-called pseudo-kidney sign. So the colon looks like if there's another kidney. So you have this hypoechoic rim of tumor and inside the hyperechoic reflexes of the gas bubbles. So it looks like a pseudo-kidney over here. And this also a finding which you can easily detect if there is a great tumor in the great bowel. So just let us show you some more video clips. Again, we yeah. see we are in the right upper quadrant because we saw a glimpse of the gallbladder yeah, here. Yeah, near the gallbladder. And we could mistake that for a kidney, so that's why it's called pseudo-kidney sign. This hypoechoic wall of the tumor in the okay, colon. Yeah. Again here. This is not the right kidney as it seems to be, but it is the right colon flexure, somewhere the right colon and um, with this pseudo kidney sign as a sign for a tumor. Another case of a really great carcinoma, I think. Let's 
sigma rectum. You won't overlook that for sure, but it's good to know that this can also cause the obstruction and when you follow it a little bit more cranially you can identify the structure to which it belongs to because here's the sigmoid colon over there and this mass it's a longitudinal scan to orientate so this is the urinary bladder over here yeah. and right cranial and caudal to the urinary bladder you find this really great carcinoma with some gas bubbles in the center and this tremendous thickening of the wall over there. So this can be the cause for an obstruction of course. So let's have this as a sum up. When uh, we have the hint for a carcinoma of the colon we see segmental and asymmetric thickening of the colon wall so-called pseudo kidney sign not to mistake for a kidney. So when you find two kidneys in a patient on the right side or on the left side, so maybe Something's there's wrong. something wrong. We got this central hyperechoic content, which is uh, consisting of gas bubbles. And important is, normally there's no or only slight pain during examination yeah. in comparison to an inflammatory process. Inflammatory process normally uh, creates pain to the patient. And when we see um, a tumor like that and the patient experiences no pain during our examination, this is suspicious for a tumor, of course. Yes. But with B-mode ultrasound, we cannot uh, distinguish between benign and malignant uh, stenosis, so further uh, investigations have to be done, so CT scan and endoscopic examinations, of course. Okay. Histology. Ah, there's something for you I wanted ah. to show you again. Uh, because in this case, this is not a malignant lesion of the patient. This patient, uh, uh, 88 years old, um, man who had um, recurrent diverticulitis, let's, his, uh, likes, uh, looks like a tumor, no. but it's just um, chronic diverticulitis. Here we can see the lumen narrowed, but still something going through. And the diagnosis was yeah. confirmed per CT and endoscopy. So just as an example, that you cannot distinguish between benign and malignant lesions. So I think Very good again. example for this because it looks really like a carcinoma at the first glimpse, but afterwards it was only a chronic inflammatory disease over there. Mm. Good for the patient. Yeah. So, let's get on to the next question, I think. I hope we covered everything for you, Akida. If not, please just write us an email and we will try to cover everything you need. Okay, next question. It's from Amir. Uh, and ah, yes. The question is, I have very much confusion to rule out appendicitis. Could you please teach me and landmarks and techniques? So, so thank you, Ami. I think um, many of our users will be glad that you asked this question because in patients with acute abdominal pain, appendicitis or ruling out appendicitis is a real important topic. So we can show you our way how we scan the appendicitis region. We start at the, in the right upper abdomen shortly below the rib cage, place the transducer, maybe you see it better like that, place the transducer shortly below the rib cage and then trace the ascending colon downwards in the transverse view until you reach the cecum and the terminal ileum. And then we've got four important landmarks. First the cecum, the terminal ileum, then the psoas muscle and the iliac vessels. And then it's a matter of rotating and tilting your transducer a little bit more caudally uh, until you find a tubular structure without any peristaltics and less than six millimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm. We have shown this on the, on the anatomic model and on the live scanning in our online course. We will show you some scenes of this video. Okay, let's start that. Here we can see the right kidney in cross-section and these hyperechoic areas are reflexes of colon gas. So we can see the right colon flexure and the ascending colon over here. The colon gas can easily be detected by the artifacts they produce. We have dorsal attenuation and we have reverberations over here. So we move the transducer even more caudally to find the terminal ileum. So we see this in this clip. Over here, this tubular structure with peristaltics 
and fluid content over here is the terminal ileum. And we look for the landmarks in this video clip. Over here we can see the psoas muscle. A very important landmark when it comes up to finding the appendix in ultrasound. And medially we detect the iliac vessels, more ventrally the iliac artery and more dorsally the iliac vein. And here we see in between the psoas muscle and the abdominal wall two tubular structures. One with peristaltic over here, that's the terminal ileum, and one without peristaltics. So this is the appendix. appendix. Let's see this in the next video. We can see an intestinal structure with peristaltics. So this is the terminal ileum. And situated dorsally, we can see a small tubular structure without any peristaltic movement. And we already found the appendix. In this particular case, we use the linear probe. So we can use a higher frequency. And we have this distinct picture of the appendix over here because higher frequency means higher resolution. Let's repeat our four important landmarks for detecting the appendix in ultrasound. First, the cecum. It's gas-filled structure with typical frustration in the right lower abdomen with a blind end. Second, the terminal ileum and the ileocecal valve. Mostly fluid-filled intestinal structure entering the cecum medially. Third, the psoas muscle in cross-section we already encountered the psoas muscle in our basic abdominal course, especially when we scanned the kidneys. We find the psoas muscle dorsally and medially of the cecum. And fourth, the iliac vessels, an important landmark, situated medially of the psoas muscle, also in a cross section. The right iliac artery is situated more ventrally, and we find the right iliac vein behind dorsally of the iliac artery. Once again, we see the psoas muscle over here, iliac vessels here, here you will see the cecum, yes, and in this area, terminal ileum. So, as you saw, we first used the abdominal probe, the curved array uh, probe, and afterwards to get an overview, the curved array, and afterwards the linear probe to get a more detailed uh, picture. And this is, I think, the most effective way to find the appendix and the landmarks. So, after identifying landmarks and the scanning the appendiceal region, of course, we want to know what appendicitis looks like in ultrasound. So, let's see that now. Here we can see. Okay. Okay. And now over here, you see, you can easily see this is tubular structure over here, which is more than six millimeters in diameter, and there's a swollen wall of this appendix over here, and it's painful during the examination. So the sonographic palpation is positive. There's pain during the compression of the appendix. You also see these hyperechoic regions surrounding the appendix over here. This is the fatty tissue reaction, the inflammation, which exceeds also already the, the appendix and involves the surrounding adjacent structures over here. The landmarks, the abdominal wall over here, portion of the uh, psoas muscle and iliac vessels in this region. I think we can show that on the Next slide. Ah, so okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Again, our landmarks to find the appendix, iliac vessels, psoas muscle, the terminal ileum, and of course here this dilated appendix. So when we diagnose an appendicitis, we can be sure that this is, that this is true. But um, to find a healthy appendix is not possible in every patient. There are some cases Let's see, I a lot so. of cases yeah. where we cannot distinguish the healthy appendix. So it depends on um, putting the puzzle pieces together because appendicitis is a diagnosis of clinical findings, about lab tests and also 
imaging methods like ultrasound. I think. Do you agree with me? Yes, and I think it's it's good when the clinician performs the ultrasound because you can reevaluate the patient in, in some hours later, and you see the lab test, you see where the pain is. So it's fine if you use as a clinician the ultrasound to find the appendix. What I do often is that I ask the patient to help me and guide the ultrasound probe to the point of greatest pain, which helps me for finding the right diagnosis. This or, is maybe a tip for you. Yeah, or you can hand over the, the transducer to the patient and the patient should place it on the point of the greatest pain. Also a way to find it. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay, so... Uh, Ali asked us how does liver cirrhosis appear in ultrasound? So that's a really important question because that's uh, th something we can uh, come over every day in clinical life. So let's see how liver cirrhosis looks like. And of course we covered that already in our basic abdominal course. So we want to show you a little excerpt of our video over there. Let's take a look at this picture over here. What would you think? When you take a look at the capsular contour of the liver, is it smooth? I think it's quite irregular. It's like small little humps everywhere. So that's a feature of liver cirrhosis that the liver contour is not regular. It's irregular and a little bit humpy like here. And when we take a look at the liver parenchyma over here, the echogenicity is not homogeneous. The tissue is not homogeneous. It's somehow irregular too. And also take a look at this small dark area over here. It's free fluid and that points to ascites. So that means this patient has already an advanced case of hepatic cirrhosis. Let's take a... So let's recapitulate the ultrasound features of liver cirrhosis. We've seen the humpy irregular liver surface in comparison to normal smooth capsula. We detected that liver parenchyma has an inhomogeneous echogenicity. We saw that liver veins can be narrowed and that the portal vein can be enlarged because of portal hypertension. And we also saw ascites, so we know that cirrhosis of the liver, especially in advanced cases, is associated with ascites. So let's rec Sorry <laughs> about that. So um, we want to show you some more examples because we think it's important that you see different patients with liver cirrhosis and we want to recapitulate these features of cirrhosis over there. So what can we see over here? This is a liver. <laughs> yes, but it's hard to detect. There are no liver veins anymore seen over here. And take a close look to the surface. So is it smooth? No. It isn't. This is this irregular surface over here. And it's easy to see this surface because there's ascites over here, free fluid surrounding the liver. It's more difficult to detect this irregular liver surface when there's no ascites, ascites present, but of course it's possible. So just one thing, a normal healthy liver has a smooth capsular contour. Correct. And the parenchyma of the liver is quite inhomogeneous. There are areas which seems to be hypoechoic, darker, and other ones are more intense, bright, so with hyperechoic. So this is a very inhomogeneous parenchyma, and you can see it's also an enlarged over here. The border is not a sharp angle over here. So, and, and in, the, in the far field, you also see this attenuation. You cannot depict every segment of the liver in the far field, which is due to the increased attenuation of our ultrasound beams in liver cirrhosis. So let's see another example. Here we got a liver cirrhosis without ascites. So you will see here, you have to, <laughs> sorry. Turn around. Turn around, okay. I think you take that. Take that. 
<laughs> Start it again. Again, okay. sorry about that. So, I don't know. Okay, the liver surface, counter? capsular yeah. contour. If you look closely, you can see also here that it's not smooth anymore. Especially in the caudal. Especially in the here. caudal rim. So yes. take also the cranial and the caudal rim of the liver and follow it so to see if the capsular contour is smooth. And what we also can see here is that the echogenicity is inhomogeneous. It's like small little nodules everywhere. And that's one thing which is really suspicious to me. Christian, you know what I mean, I think? Yeah, yes, over here. This area over here. This is a focal lesion. It's a hypoechoic area inside a cirrhotic liver. And that's, of course, suspicious for... Liver carcinoma. So we have to do further investigations and maybe biopsy in this case. But again, um, look at liver parenchyma, not only inhomogeneous, but we can hardly detect the liver veins yep, because they correct. are narrowed. So I hope we covered everything about liver cirrhosis. Again, sum up, irregular liver surface, um, small little humps and bumps, inhomogeneous echogenicity, uh, narrowed liver veins. Sometimes the portal vein is enlarged, especially in portal hypertension. Uh, often we see the caudate lobe very prominent. Uh, it's enlarged in comparison to the rest of the liver. Sometimes we can see regenerative nodules. Often we see ascites. And of course, there's an increased risk for liver cell carcinoma. Okay. Okay, I see there's a, a live question coming in. It's from, let's see, um, Luisa. Can I exclude abdominal aortic aneurysm with ultrasound? Yes, that's a really good question, uh, which can also be an issue in uh, daily clinical practice. Of course, let's say as a general rule, yes. As long as you can depict the aorta with the ultrasound beam, then you can exclude aortic aneurysm. But sometimes, of course, it can be difficult to find the aorta because the patient um, is suffering from meteorism or is an obese one and so we got a few tips for you for finding the aorta maybe getting better views so uh, when you scan the very cranial portion of the aorta it's it would be fine to use the liver lobe as an acoustic window so ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold the breath so the liver comes up quite Quarterly, and you can use the left liver lobe as an acoustic window and you can trace the aorta and measure its diameter. So, you know, below 2.5 centimeters, it's the normal diameter of the aorta. More than three centimeters, you have got an aortic aneurysm. And if the diameter exceeds five centimeters, the risk for rupture is quite high. Also the spontaneous risk for rupture. So try this for the cranial portion. And for the more quarterly portion, you will need some pressure on the patient, so the graded compression. You put on the probe and increase the pressure on the abdominal wall but of the not patient. not too much. The patient should survive. They should survive that. Yes, he will. He will. <laughs> um, and so you can, you, you can try to, to compress the gas-filled structures, the intestinal loops, and you can replace the gas side to, to get a better image on the abdominal aorta mm -hmm. and follow it quarterly to the bifurcation and measure it through the whole um, the whole organ so when and no I, that's uh, something uh, more i wanted to say because um there's one way from the left lateral window where you can find the aorta in really difficult patients um, you ask the patient to roll on his right side uh, and then put the probe at the mid or even posterior axillary line and then tilt and rotate the transducer a little bit so you can depict the aorta in a longitudinal plane. But to try this method, maybe I think you should yeah. Yeah. practice it train before. This for train this before in, on in healthy patients, patients to find yes, it. But to be sure that's that you can often depict the possibility yeah. when yeah. you can find the aorta even in difficult conditions. But uh, I must admit that are, at least there are some cases where we can't depict mm. the aorta, and then of course we cannot um, cannot exclude aortic yeah. aneurysm. But the lateral pathway is, is re really fine, and sometimes you can also depict the renal artery 
uh, from there. So try this on, on healthy patients to get uh, a glimpse of the aorta from, from the lateral view. So, okay, let's but there's get another, on. Ah, there's another okay. question on, on the aorta. It's from Aljona. I sometimes find it difficult to distinguish the IVC and the abdominal aorta. Can you tell me how to do this? Okay. Ah, that's a yeah, good question. Because very important, until yes. you've, you uh, exclude aortic aneurysm, you have to find the aorta first. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for this question, Luisa. So, uh, when you take a close look to the aorta on, on the longitudinal view, you see the aorta is an artery, of course, so there's a single pulse. There's a very defined, quite thick wall of the aorta. And you can see sometimes see the branches which originate from the, the aorta ventrally, so the celiac trunk and the superior mesenteric artery. So you can see these uh, findings for the aorta. And the, may the I aorta talk is, about the IVC? Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. And the IVC in comparison uh, has a double pulse. It's like wop 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 wop. Not a single pulse like the aorta, but a double pulse, and its diameter is changing with the breathing of the patient, whereas the aortic diameter does not change, luckily. Uh, and when you see the IVC in a cross scan, it's not completely round, but it's more overly shaped like an eye, about that, and you see this double pulse. And uh, the wall of the IVC is not so distinguishable, it's not so bright as the aortic wall. You agree with me? Yes, and if you have a transverse scan, it's easy. The, the aorta is more left-sided and the IVC is right-sided to the aorta. And the diameter of the IVC changes during uh, inspiration and expiration. And when the patient holds breath, it increases in diameter. And when the patient goes on breathing, it, it's getting uh, less in diameter. So this you can use to distinguish both of them. So thank you, Aljona, uh, for this question. Okay, now let's get on. What From about Amit? Amit sent us uh, a question about ileocecal pathologies. Okay, that's a quite interesting. Big uh, chapter, yes, I think. Yes, it's a great, great issue in abdominal ultrasound. So this, this region of the ileocecal valve is quite often the origin of pain and of inflammatory diseases. We already mentioned the appendicitis in, in this region. Mm -hmm. Colon carcinoma. Colon carcinoma. Yeah, um, sometimes in, in younger patients there are inflammation of lymph nodes which can cause pain, but there's a really great uh, chapter of the inflammatory bowel disease, so uh, Crohn's disease and also the ulcerative uh, colitis. Which but can only if it's backwash elitis. Yes, so <laughs> the main issue is the, the Crohn's disease. So um, I think we have to just take a look on, on the normal uh, valve first, so we can distinguish it from, from a disease over there. Okay, let's see that over there. As we told you in the cecum, we, we can see gas, so colon gas. Maybe we did some landmarks before yeah, to okay. orientate. Okay, <laughs> try so. So as we have seen before, psoas muscle in this region, iliac vessels over here, abdominal wall in this region, and here you see this fluid this, field structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over here is colon gas. And when you tilt down the probe quarterly, you see this tubular structure, fluid field. Maybe you can stop it over here. And now we have this junction over here from the terminal ileum entering the cecal pole in this region. So there's a normal peristalsis. Diameter is okay. No wall thin, thickening. Yes, a thin wall, of course. And now we go on. See if there are. Maybe ah, this is one. a great picture. It's a linear scan, so we have a really good uh, resolution. resolution over there, high frequency, psoas muscle, abdominal wall, the cecal pole. Iliac vessels, here. I see the iliac vessels yeah. of orientation. Okay. And here you see this lovely, healthy terminal ileum. Beautiful clip. Propulsive peristalsis, very thin wall, mucosa over there. And in this case, we can see there is no disease in the cecal valve region. We and continue with something pathologic, inflammation. So when inflammation takes place, the wall is sickening, is getting thicker and hypoechoic, and there is 
a narrowing of the lumen over here. But let's orientate first again, sorry. Yeah. To interrupt you. Can you show us the landmarks? Mm. Maybe this you way. take the mask, <laughs> okay. I think I'm not capable so of that. So is muscle iliac vessels here. This is colon, cecum, cecum over here, gas field. Junction. And over here you see this tremendous thickening of the wall. It's more than one centimeter over here and also in the dorsal portion. And this is a patient with acute Crohn's disease. Yeah, it's a painful examination for the patient, acute inflammation, acute stenosis, inflammatory stenosis now. You can see the gas bubbles can hardly pass through here. Narrowed lumen. And, and this is Let's see the perfect next one. picture mm -hmm. of a Crohn's disease. So we can, in this case, it's important not to mix it up with uh, appendicitis. Okay, but again, psoas muscle, iliac vessels, ileocecal valve, cecum over there, terminal ileum, and you can see the wall thickening is even going further into the terminal ileum, not only ileocecal valve, but also over there, more cranially. This is typical for Crohn's disease. Yeah, because there's no thickening in the portion of the large bowel of the cecum, you see? Almost healthy in this region. Okay. As we told you, in uh, younger patients and children, quite often we have painful uh, complaints in the right lower quadrant and the, these... One cause of it can be a mesenteric lymph Yeah, so the lymph nodes are painful, they are enlarged, they are swollen and when you, when you find them, detect them with ultrasound and compress them, this is the typical pain which the patient complains about. Let's see that over see there. Over here. Oval see, shaped. Show us the abdominal wall first. Abdominal maybe. wall. It's okay. a linear scan. I think a portion of the psoas muscle over here. Mm -hmm. And these overly shaped lymph nodes, which are painful during the examination and quite hypoechoic. And the next one over here. Again. So Maybe there's a viral infection of the uh, intestine. Sometimes a bacterial infection can yes. take place too. And most times it's self-limitating and nothing has to be done, but not to mix up with uh, Crohn's disease or appendicitis. It's a differential diagnosis. It is. Especially in young people. Again, here the example of this swollen lymph nodes over there. Other dif differential diagnosis could be uh, a hernia. In, in the region or uh, inflammation of the fallopian tube or sometimes the rupture of an ovarian cyst in female patients, also abdominal bleeding and urinary tract infection. So some of these uh, findings we can rule out with ultrasound. Okay, so we covered that, I hope. Yeah, let's go on. It's it covered all your questions. And let's move on now. What Judith asks us, how does acute cholecystitis appear in ultrasound? This is the perfect question for abdominal ultrasound. So <laughs> we mentioned it in our online course. Let's see some minutes of this. Oh, you look nice here, Christian. Yeah. What are the findings of an acute inflammation of the gallbladder? The thick wall of the gallbladder shows us its various layers already three layers will be visible and moreover some pain is felt when the gallbladder is touched or nearly touched by the transducer while we're doing the exam and this we call the sonographic Murphy sign. So we'll summarize the findings. The wall is thicker than four millimeters, layers of the gallbladder are visible and there is pain during the scan. Of course, there are other clinical findings like temperature and blood tests, but these are the sonographic findings. If we see free fluid around the gallbladder, we know that the infection process has exceeded to the other organs. We also can see hypoechoic areas within the liver and maybe an obstruction of bile ducts due to the gallstone. What are the findings? 
So here is another example for acute cholecystitis. I'm sure this is painful to the patient yeah. when we palpate it over here. We see this enlarged organ. This, this is the gallbladder filled with sludge and many, many small uh, gallstones over there. And we can see this distinct layering of the gallbladder over there, over there. Definitely thickened and also the different layers of the gallbladder wall can mm. be distinguished here. So this is also I think you can also see pus over here and maybe there are some gas bubbles from produced by bacteria. So this is a very really severe inflammation of the gallbladder. And so be this, uh, before we go on, I would like to ask our viewers one question because we've got uh, many questions concerning gastrointestinal ultrasound. So uh, we want to meet your needs and answer all your questions and uh, prepare the chapters online which you really need out there. And we would like to ask you how many of you are interested in gastrointestinal ultrasound. Just say yes or no uh, if you're interested or if you're not so that we get a feedback which chapters to prepare in the near future. Meanwhile, I think we should yeah, go we, we on. got oh, also, yes. yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, so Maybe we got another wait. question. How to find the gallbladder and ultrasound? Yeah, this is really important to make up the diagnosis. You have to find it uh, before you can make up the diagnosis. So in our online course, we showed uh, four ways, four pathways to find the um, uh, gallbladder and some hints for this. So it's very important that the patient is fastening before. So if the patient has taken in. You're right. I mean, for, yeah. I'm sorry, in but acute sometimes setting, the patient. You won't get this, but yes. if, if, if possible. It, if okay. possible, this would be fine. And turn the patient on her, her left side, elevate the right arm above the head, and ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold the breath. So you can, you can manage to, to get the liver quarterly and also the gallbladder is caudally, so you can make up your subcoastal views of the gallbladder. It's really important to put the, the patient in this position, so it will be much more easier to find for you. And then use the landmarks, as the, the branches of the portal vein and the caudal uh, border of the liver lobe. And if everything is filled with gas and meteorism and if it's very difficult or you're on the ICU or there's a patient from the emergency you um, can't turn him on his left side yeah then there's another pathway which is very very useful for your clinical practice use the intercostal pathway so place the probe in between the ribs and manage to tilt the probe to find the region of the gallbladder the region of the common bile duct sometimes you can also see the IVC and the, the right kidney in this view, but you will manage to get a glimpse on the on the gallbladder, which is quite important also in cases of uh, patients on the ICU, which have quite common uh, complications in, in the gallbladder, like the acute inflammation of the gallbladder in intensive care patients. Ready? Yeah. Because we got the result of our question. Great. great. So the majority of you out there would like to have more about gastrointestinal ultrasound. Mm -hmm which would be yeah. a pleasure for us too, because we also like to do gastrointestinal ultrasound. So thank you, Ragav, Anka, and everybody out there for answering our question. And um, we are planning to cover this chapter in the near future. We're already working on that. You know, uh, appendicitis, the chapter of appendicitis is already online and you can get this if you want. And um, yes, but we will prepare the rest of the gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal ultrasound sorry, uh, in the near future. I think it will be ready by 2019, how to find the healthy organs and uh, also a lot of different pathologies of the gastrointestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned and we will keep you informed. And we have seen this interest in also in the live event on gastrointestinal ultrasound. The room was really filled with participants on, on our lecture of gastrointestinal ultrasound. So, ah, there's one question. How to measure whether the liver is enlarged? This is a quite interesting uh, um, question because in the textbooks you will find 
centimeters, centimeters measured in the medial line and axillary line and something like that. The question uh, comes from Martin. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, thanks. Because it's an important question. And another hint was to measure whether the, the right liver lobe uh, is caudally to the right kidney or not. So I think measuring centimeters is not really easy. To get an information about the size of an organ, you can use uh, measurements for volume, but they are also quite complicated for the liver. So we are using uh, another approach. So we look on the border, the caudal border of the, right, uh, of the liver. So we measure it in the, on the left and then the right liver lobe. And when you take a close look to the caudal liver uh, angle, on the left side, it should not exceed 30 degrees. So it should be quite a sharp angle on the, uh, on the left liver lobe. and the right liver lobe, it, the angle could be up to 45 de degrees. So measuring by eyeballing, I would say. Um, this could be a quite uh, good hint for the, the liver if there is a hepatomegaly or not. And some rough estimation can be done measuring the, the thickness from anterior to posterior if it exceeds more than 15 centimeters in the... Uh, mm, no. got a, I there's a hint, but you can... yeah, it's not really the best way to, to measure it in, in centimeters. So We've look on the border. We've discussed it for several times yeah. because sometimes in quite tall and slim persons the liver border, the lower liver border is coming quite caudally in perfectly healthy person. So yeah. I would not want to make the bill. Yeah. So it's keeping an eye on the rim of the inferior border of the liver. And, and you should mention the echogenicity. If there is, are really yes. signs for uh, steatosis, increased echogenicity, the, the uh, lack of, of um, liver veins, so attenuation in the far field. So if you're sure there is a, a higher steatosis, Mostly the liver is enlarged also when, you, when you're concerned about cirrhosis. So I think we've got time for one more question. Okay. Maybe. Mm -hmm. There was one about... Stefan Tal had a question. How can I see ischemia of the intestinal vessels, especially incomplete stenosis? What should a normal blood for an mesenteric artery look like? This is a very um, uh, advanced uh, question for abdominal ultrasound and it's not so easy to detect ischemia in this normal B-mode ultrasound. There are several techniques using contrast agent and I think this is a topic which is of increasing interest. You can use contrast agent in abdominal ultrasound. You apply a small amount of gas bubbles which are coated with, with a lipid uh, a layer and they pass through the lung and enter the arterial uh, system and then you can see these bubbles uh, in all the organs also in the intestine and if there is a regional lack of perfusion you can be quite sure that there is an ischemia but this technique is not very common used in, in especially in Austria but it's uprising and we're doing our best to get it into clinical practice and, and make, make up courses for this. To measure the, the velocity of, of blood in the intestinal vessels is sometimes possible. And if there is a really high-grade stenosis, you will see an increase of velocity of blood flow in especially the superior mesenteric artery, which exceeds 2.5 meters per second. But then you have to be quite trained to use color Doppler and pulsed Doppler. So you have to use the right angle, take a perfect look on the origin of the stenosis. It's the same like the stenosis in, in renal arteries. You have to get a perfect picture, a good machine, and you have to be used to this method. Slim patient, no yeah. meteorism, that's a problem with ultrasound. Okay. Uh, Stefan again. Where do you measure the, then IV, the IVC di diameter? Mm -hmm. I've read about one to two centimeters caudally of the liver border, but it often seems not to be representative. So where do you take it? Normally I take it two centimeters away from the uh, right atrium. 
about yeah. that. That's a good place to measure. I try to do so measure. because but. then you have a good <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, acoustic window of the liver. So you can you put on the M mode and measure it over there if you measure. So I'm only measuring it when I'm concerned about any state of uh, right heart failure or something like that. Congestion. Congestion, yes. The thing is, the most important uh, marker for congestion dilatation of the IVC is the lacking of um, the decrease of diameter. Decrease of diameter. So that's even more. Ask the patient to take a deep breath, sniffing like that, and if the diameter of the IVC does not reduce more than 50% of its diameter, then you have a really good indicator for uh, right heart failure and congestion. Yeah. Because there's uh, also a lot of healthy, especially young women, you have a quite large diameter of the IVC and are perfectly healthy, and but they have a normal changement of the diameter, more than 50%. So I think that's even... Uh, more important than measuring the IVC, but I think one to two, let's say two centimeters um, away from the right atrium is a good place to measure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So I think there was nothing about uh, biliary obstruction, and we can shall we cover the one uh, one question? I think is okay. Yeah. So the question was from. From Imani, she asked us about biliary obstruction. What does it look like in ultrasound? So I think we can cover that. Here we got a video clip. This is the right liver lobe. And what we can see at once is that we got double contours over there. Normally, the bile ducts inside the liver are not seen. Uh, You can only see the branches of the portal vein. And when you see this double contours parallel to the portal vein's branches, then you got dilated bile ducts. It's also called double barrel shotgun sign. And it's easy to detect that? in this case. I think you see there is more than one tubular structure. And so there's something wrong. You can use color Doppler that you can differentiate between a vessel and a bile duct. But there's okay. obviously an obstruction of the bile ducts in the liver and, and you can course, look for the cause. Yeah. Yes, and of course you have to measure the common bile duct, which should not exceed 6 millimeters when the gold is still present and not exceed 10 millimeters when the patient had already undergone cholecystectomy. And in this case, we can also see the problem of the patient. This is the common bile duct which is clearly dilated. We've got liver parenchyma over there. And inside the bile duct, we've got this small object, some sludge, and in this case, a stone in the common bile duct. So measure the common bile duct, look out for dilatation of intrahepatic bile ducts, and also if you see a dilated common bile duct, follow its course, and maybe you can also see the cause for the obstruction. Yeah, you see all this dorsal shadowing over here, which indicates there is a structure that blocks our ultrasound scan. In this case, this calcificated stone in this region. Yeah. Okay, better than the tumor, which is quite often the problem causing bilateral obstruction. Okay, so again, let's sum up bilateral obstruction. The common bile duct is Dilated means more than 6 millimeters when the gallbladder is still present, more than 10 millimeters when the patient has undergone uh, cholecystectomy, and we can see the intrahepatic bile ducts dilated. Normally they are not visible, and we got this gnarled tree sign or double barrel shotgun sign. So the biliary tree seen parallel to the branches of the portal vein. Another uh, yeah, one more. Uh, yeah, about another organ of the abdomen, urinary bladder, and how to measure the volume. This is a quite often asked question. Who was uh, the question is from uh, um, Inga. 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 Okay, Inga. Yes, um, the volume of the urinary bladder. How can we measure that? We also prepared a little bit of our online course for you because it's already 
online, how to measure the urinary bladder. Let's see that here. A multiplied by B multiplied by C and divided by 2. Many ultrasound machines have their own volume calculation program, but still some don't and I think in any way it is very helpful to be able to calculate the bladder volume for yourself. So we need three diameters. I again start with a transverse suprapubic view, place my transducer, the lower abdomen, feel behind the pubic bone, look for a mark which is pointing towards me, get a good picture of the urinary bladder, in the center of the monitor picture, press the freeze button and now we can take my measurements. We got the transverse diameter from the right to the left side of the patient, which is 10 centimeters here. Sorry, take it again. And the second diameter is the ventral dorsal one over here, which is 45, 4.5 centimeters. We stored it. And then we need a third diameter. So we have to turn our transducer again into the longitudinal view. We stay at the lower abdomen, turn clockwise around 90 degrees, tilt our transducer again behind the pubic bone. Our mark is pointing to the head of the patient. Press the freeze button. And now we need the craniocaudal diameter from the top of the bladder to the bottom. Just about here. Which is 90 millimeters. So now that we've got our three diameters, we can calculate the volume. We remember the formula is a multiplied by B multiplied by C divided by 2. So we take our first diameter, A, which is 10 centimeters, multiplied by 4.5 centimeters, which was diameter B, multiplied by 9 centimeters, this is 405 milliliters, and this divided by 2 is about 200 milliliters, which is a normal volume for a filled urinary bladder. Fine. Uh, uh, Sorry. Once again? Okay. No, not really. <laughs> okay. So, Stefan said, thank you. You're very yeah. welcome. We want to be there for you. Thank you for asking so many questions. Yes, I think time is going fast. We have to stop now. Yeah. We always have to stop when it's best. <laughs> <laughs> but we are looking forward uh, to see you online or on the live events or read uh, your questions and we uh, will answer them by email or in the next webinar and we'll take all these issues for the next chapters we are doing online. Anyway, uh, thank you for joining us today and now that we have to stop we at least want to wish you a happy new year, happy, prosperous and healthy new year. Stay tuned and we want to keep contact with you and go out there, scan everything in abdominal region that's possible because you can only win by doing abdominal ultrasound and we want to help you getting better and better. And that's our main aim. <laughs> okay. So bye and bye. see you. See you. Happy new year. Happy new year.